And I won't go into that now, but to me that is when we get um, discouraged or challenged, to really think and say, you know, it was not so long ago, it was my lifetime and probably many of yours, that people were smoking on planes, smoking in restaurants, smoking in this conference room. And you would look around 30 years ago and say, well, that's never gonna change. We can change these things, but we're not gonna do it by spending all our time standing on a corner telling people to walk this way or drive this way. We're gonna need to go to high levels of systems change. And you're gonna hear about that from San Francisco and New York. The basis for all of this is being data-driven. Vision Zero really does start with the numbers. And I'll share, and Nicole will share much more from San Francisco, but this is a, a kind of replication of what is happening in cities across the country. San Francisco is not different than LA, or Seattle, or Portland, or New York, or Chicago. Most of the severe, and by the way, this is severe, most of the disproportionate number of severe crashes, injury crashes, are happening on a relatively small number of streets. We can manage this. We know where to put our energy. What the data is also showing us is that, surprise, surprise, not all communities have been created equal in our transportation plan and, and providing. Um, and what this is showing, the big red dots are showing where there's disproportionate impact, negative impact, on low-income communities around the country. So people are, are affected by traffic violence around the country, but particularly in low-income communities, in communities of color, amongst senior citizens, amongst children, amongst people walking, biking, and people with disabilities. The facts are indisputable. Folks have known this for quite a while, but we haven't really prioritized it in our planning, I would say, and our resources. So Vision Zero is helping us do that. And then finally, the last couple. Vision Zero, again, is about everyone. It really is a big tent approach. So it's about people walking, biking, driving, kind of moving outside our silos there, which is gonna help us, I think, win. We're also engaging more diverse and critical stakeholders, moving beyond just the transportation realm, which you'll hear about. And Vision Zero, I'd say, most importantly, is bringing new urgency to this work. This is not a planning exercise. This is not theory. This is not a slogan we're tagging on a, a side of a bus if we're doing it right. This is deep systems change. This is affecting business as usual. And it can't come soon enough because we're talking about people's lives. So I'm very happy now. What we're gonna do is go Oprah style. Put my contact info up again later. Um, can folks hear me if I talk like this? Yeah. Yes, yeah, right. Awesome. Yes, you were such a loud talker. You don't even need that microphone. <laughs> I don't do that. Nah, you guys should talk. Oh, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> my so I'm going to ask Nicole from San Francisco and Caroline from New York City a series of questions. We kind of got it back and forth. These are the kinds of questions we get a lot from people around the country and, and in Canada um, around Vision Zero, and then we're going to open it up to your questions as well. So they're going to be running through some slides in, in the start of this. So just to start with both of you, and I think Caroline, you're going first, tell us a little bit about how Vision Zero started in your community. What was the impetus? Um, so I'm okay without the mic. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Hey everyone. Um, so uh, Vision Zero, not a new idea. As Leah said, it came from Sweden, as most of us know. Um, up on the screen is a report that we did in 2012, um, outlining how if we brought that idea to New York City, we could save um, countless lives. Um, and then we were faced with an opportunity that most advocates long for. We had an election, a mayoral election in 2013. We had the same mayor for three terms, Mayor Mike Bloomberg, and we were sort of, uh, you know, at a crossroads where we were worried that the issues of street safety, great street design were maybe going to get um, pushed aside because it had been such a priority for Mayor Bloomberg. Would the new mayor also value them? And so we really um, took that to heart and we started putting together um, a package of Vision Zero um, materials and information for all of the mayoral candidates and set our sights on making it an election year issue. And um, around August, you know, we worked hard to build individual support like good advocates do. We had petitions, we had, um, you know, debates. Um, in August, we began a more intense mobilization. There were a series of high profile crashes. Um, we brought them to the candidates' attention. We held a massive rally on the steps of City Hall, um, and we got the, the media hit we hoped to get, which was one of the leading candidates, then candidate de Blasio, coming out and saying that he liked this idea of Vision Zero, and that he 
um, would plan to make it his priority should he be elected mayor. Um, and, and I wanted to focus in particular on something that we then started to put an extra attention on, which is the, I think, unique, a unique part of Vision Zero. You know, the traditional approach to traffic safety is that, yeah, there's this interest among people to have safer streets. In the Vision Zero city, in the Vision Zero community, the people actually get involved, right? They start to demand this change of their government, of their decision makers. Um, and right after, um, right around election time, so right as Mayor de Blasio was elected and right following his election, but before he actually you know, stood out there on the steps on January 1st, there was um, a sort of perfect storm of tragedies that happened in New York City. There were four very high profile deaths involving young kids, um, all of whom were with their guardians. Um, for the most part, on the top left, Allison Liao was killed crossing the street with her grandmother. Um, to the right, Sammy Cohen Eckstein was killed, a 12-year-old, um, with a soccer ball on the street outside of his apartment. The lower left, Lucian Merriweather was killed holding his mom's hand on a sidewalk by a driver that jumped a curb. And then to the right of Lucian is Cooper Stock, who was killed in a crosswalk, walking hand in hand with his dad as he crossed the street with the right of way by a turning cab. Um, as I think as advocates, for those of us in the room that are advocates, even if we aren't, um, I often think of like, you know, advocacy as a series of dress rehearsals you go through hoping for the right political moment when your thing, your idea will actually take hold. And the amazing thing about this moment was that there was a credence being given to this idea of Vision Zero by the newly elected mayor. And there were, um, you know, people that had suffered the loss and wanted to do something about it that started to demand change. And these are the parents of these young children who decided that they wanted to be a part of something that was going to make sure this didn't happen for other people. And they found us and we started to connect them to one another. Um, and with that, we formed a new part of our organization called Families for Safe Streets. I encourage you to check it out on the website, familyforsafestreets.org. There are now chapters popping up around the country, one in San Francisco. Um, and um, this group is a group of survivors of traffic crashes who are bringing a new and unique voice to the problem of, of um, traffic violence. And the mayor quickly realized that he could use these people and this group um, to justify his priority of Vision Zero and to create a sort of political appetite right in the city for, for change. And this is um, him sitting down um, right before he announces his Vision Zero priority to the public, getting input from these, these families. And here he is standing um, on January 15th, one of the first things he did as, as a new mayor with these families again, announcing that he was going to put a stop to traffic violence. So that's a little insight into to New York. Okay, so San Francisco looked a little a little different than New York City. Um, actually, it was you know a similar uh, tragedy where we had um, what we called the deadly December in December 2013. Seven people had died in just one month, which for San Francisco numbers, that's a tremendous number of people. Um, usually, it's around 14 people walking getting killed and in a year, and this was you know, half of that in just one month. Um, we have about 30 people getting hit, hit and killed um, on all loads every year. So um, in just one day, we had um, actually three people getting hit, hit and killed. This story didn't actually um, accurately capture the total number of deaths. One of them was a six-year-old girl, Sophia Liu, walking in a crosswalk on the green with her mother holding her hand. Um, a Uber driver turning right hit and killed her. Hit and killed her, yeah. Um, and you know, before this time, uh, we had been doing a lot of work on pedestrian safety, but and a lot of communities were working on pedestrian safety in their own communities. So Chinatown was working on streets in Chinatown. The Tenderloin was working on streets in the Tenderloin. Um, everyone cared deeply about this issue in their communities, but there wasn't this unifying opportunity to, to demand change at a greater scale. Um, and Leah actually was the executive director of the Bike Coalition at the time and called me up after this happened and said, you know, our partners in New York are doing some really exciting work around Vision Zero. Um, what do you think of this strategy? You know, are you, are you interested? And I said, yes. 
most definitely, like without a hesitation, um, we need this. Uh, and why? Why did I say yes? And why did we? Why were we so excited about it? Um, for starters, Vision Zero helped us address something that we already knew was happening on our streets and we wanted to be more explicit about. In San Francisco, you're two times more likely to live on one of those 12% of streets that Leah shared earlier. If you're a person of color, if you're low income, if you're non-English speaking, if you're a senior or a person with a disability. Um, so traffic injuries and traffic violence don't impact our communities equally. They impact our most transit dependent communities, those that rely on walking to get around. Uh, and it's not fair. Also, our city was starting to attack, to address uh, pedestrian safety in a more systematic way. Um, actually, one of the thought the thinkers behind the Walk First strategy is Dana. If you're interested in um, in learning more, she's great waving shyly over there. <laughs> um, so they are. They are starting. They were just about to release this Walk First strategy that actually targeted those high injury corridors, um, that 12% of streets, with quick and cost-effective improvements. Um, they were trying to match their pedestrian strategy goal of reducing <coughs> crashes, severe and fatal crashes, uh, by 50% within the next five years. So they were working towards that. So we, you know, we we felt like the city was ready in terms of the analysis and they just needed to now expand this treatment or kit of parts to the other modes. Um, so what we did was we got together with other community-based organizations, about 40 um, community-based organizations signed on in support of Vision Zero before we went to the city, before we went to City Hall. And since that movement has taken, since they signed on, um, they have now formed what we call the Vision Zero Coalition of Community-Based Organizations. So while you know communities are fighting for projects in their communities, fighting for life-saving solutions in their communities, they're also fighting um, for the broader goals of Vision Zero together in a coalition. Um, so that's kind of the movement in San Francisco. So it's been a little bit different where we didn't have that strong mayoral leadership, um, but we do have that community-based support. So if you could move into a little bit, just in structure, a lot of people ask you, how are things set up both from the city side and the community side for it to be an effective Vision Zero structure? Sure. So um, this next slide is uh, my attempt to explain this. Um, so in San Francisco, we have what we call the Vision Zero Steering Committee, and that's just city staff. And um, the city staff get together, I think, bi-weekly very, very often. Um, and then we also have the Vision Zero Coalition, which I mentioned earlier, which is the community-based organizations. And we get to be together bi-monthly to shape our priorities and strategies. Um, and then we come together in this Vision Zero task force, and that's this quarterly meeting where the city is reporting out on progress, and the community gets a chance to, to hold them accountable. Um, they also, the city also engages community groups through through specific projects. So if they're going to go and do a project in the Tenderloin, they'll work with us to figure out who the right partners are to engage in the Tenderloin, or they'll, you know, they'll work with their own networks of community-based organizations. Um, we also have, the city also has these topical subcommittees. So they have an engineering subcommittee, an evaluation and data subcommittee, where they're engaging the hospitals for hospital data, and the police and the um, EMTs and all these different constituents. Um, they have a uh, communication subcommittee, et cetera. Uh, and then the community, for the, on the community side, we also have various subcommittees. Right now we have um, a very active senior and disability subcommittee that's helping to ensure that all of the Vision Zero approaches are going far enough for seniors and people with disabilities. Um, and then one thing that was really great and I'm really excited about is that we won an oversight committee um, that is the Board of Supervisors, our elected body, kind of providing this level of oversight for um, of the city's Vision Zero approach. So, you know, it's, a, it's just another kind of public accountability um, method where we can, you know, we, we can brief a supervisor and say, Here, here's where we're not seeing enough. Here's where they're doing a great job. We'd really like an update on this and that. So it's a really helpful tool as advocates to be able to 
um, hold the city accountable for multiple angles, both you know from our one-on-one -on -one meetings with cities or the task forces to that um, <coughs> task force or, or um, committee. Meeting. Caroline, um, with New York City being the longest running now Vision Zero program in a robust two and a half years, um, <laughs> what have your key lessons learned been from this time? Yeah, so um, I think the first most important lesson was something we learned, I mean, maybe in retrospect, but now good to share, which is just the importance of picking um, a strategic early win for the Vision Zero policy. It's a long uh, fight. It's a marathon, not a race, and so in, you know, infusing all the stakeholders early on with something that you can feel you know accomplished about really important. And for us, um, given the importance of speed management and Vision Zero um, everywhere, the Vision Zero is is, is in practice. Um, we set our sights on the speed limit. Speeding is a leading leading cause of death and injury in New York City by far and away, and we knew that. Um, lowering the speed limit could get us uh, lowering our numbers on injuries and fatalities really early on. Um, and this was also really important for our movement building. Um, Families for Safe Streets, with our support, um, were the leaders of this campaign. And they looked to us to get input on what their first effort was going to be. Um, and we made the case for the speed limit to them, and they felt good about the idea of setting aside their individual crashes um, to focus on something that could sort of, you know, affect the most people. Um, they, you know, they brought this message of Vision Zero and of the need for a lower speed limit to all the most important people, and I think in the process put, put Vision Zero on the map in our state in a way that it might not have been had, it, had there not been such a, a visible statewide campaign to lower our speed limit, which is what we had to do in New York City to move from 30 to 20 or 25 was to work with our state legislator. So this is Families for Safe Streets in Albany at our state capitol. During the campaign, you can see the kind of force that they were during this effort. This is you know, them standing with Governor Cuomo, um, and again, signing the bill into law um, with Mayor de Blasio. Uh, Mayor de Blasio's administration, I think, felt particular pride about this win. You know, they were able, in the first three months of their mayoral term, to, to say they've won this massive thing at the state level, right? They've delivered this for New Yorkers, and that gave us a lot of capital to work with when it came to our vision zero goals. Um, the other one, which not was not something I, I feel, I gotta say, I was so in, entrenched in winning the lower speed limit, and by the way, we did win the lower speed limit to 25. Yeah, <laughs> pretty big deal. Um, we are already seeing the benefits of that. I think that most of the reductions in injuries and fatalities we've seen in the first two and a half years, we can attribute to that speed limit change. Um, so, um, you know, in, in the process of winning and of doing this great thing, um, I don't think any of us really thought about the potential opponents that would surface. Um, and that's how the Connor, a former DOT commissioner, has a great saying, which is that when you push against the status quo, it pushes back. Um, we found ourselves in, in a pretty intense fight um, with the bus driver union in New York City about six months in to our Vision Zero work, um, there was a law that we found hard to pass, which is called the right-of-way law, which makes it a criminal misdemeanor to hit someone with the right-of-way in a crosswalk or in a bike lane. It sort of seems like common sense that there would be a sort of strict punishment for something that we know is illegal and causing serious injury and harm. Um, that was going okay. The law went into effect. It was being used by the NYPD, but then they actually arrested a bus driver um, for hitting and killing someone in a crosswalk. And uh, sure enough, it, uh, it led to an onslaught of terrible press. This is a daily news headline, um, you know, sort of trying to dismantle the, the, the value of, of Vision Zero. This is one of the ads, there were multiple ads, that the bus driver union uh, ran in the tabloids and in the press, calling out the mayor for, for not really being a progressive when he's arresting bus drivers. Um, you know, and so I think this was, you know, this was a wake-up call for us. We had a we had a big win. We were feeling good, and then we found ourselves in a fight with the union, which is a terrible place to be. You know, when, you know, we wanted to be working with our union partners on achieving Vision Zero, not fighting with them in, in a very visible way. So we had to mobilize our own reaction. This is a campaign we put together, um, and um, you know. We, we did a pretty good job, and I, and I will say we, we were successful. We defended that law. It's still intact. People are still 
being charged with it. And the third thing I wanted to quickly mention is just the importance of um, owning the watchdog role. Um, so this is this is unique to advocates, but I think you know we each have our own roles to play in a Vision Zero um, successful Vision Zero policy. City agencies, elected officials, advocates. Ours um, had to transition from innovator pushing this idea out to the world, collaborator with the city, to quickly being the group that was actually going to make sure that we were staying on track and that we were holding ourselves to the best possible Vision Zero standards keeping the brand true, as Leah's mentioned. Um, this, is a, this is a slide from our, uh, I think our second Vision Zero report card, which is one of the things we've started to do to hold our city to account and to make sure that all agencies are cooperating and, and meeting the Vision Zero goals. Um, quickly, you can see from the slide that what we've done is we've um, looked at the mayor's own stated goal of getting to Vision Zero by 24, 2024, and we quickly found that like we are totally off track, right? And that, you know, not only are we, are we off track, but let's bring the human perspective to that. You know, what does that mean if we're off track? It actually means that a lot more people are going to die and be injured. And so this is a, a, a new role for us. Um, a little bit uncomfortable. We've been giving grades to city agencies. Um, I will say that one really cool example of how this has worked for us is that right before we went to print on our first Vision Zero report card, we, as a courtesy, gave all of our agency partners a, a draft and a heads up. And um, one of the things we were calling out for the Department of Transportation was that they still had not put all of the speed cameras on the street that we had won in Albany permission to use. So imagine that, you know, we fought tire tirelessly in Albany to get permission to use 60 speed cameras, like nothing. But still, we, you know, those were gonna save lives. It was almost school, the start of the school year in September, the session had ended um, six months prior, they still didn't have these speed cameras out in the street. And so we, in our report, we called them out and magically, before we went to print, they were able to get, um, get them out on the street and to commit to that. So we're, you know, we, we were able to modify the report, but also count that as an early win. Um, so those are, yeah, those are two things. In a one minute, yeah, this will be this one. Um, we've all mentioned the importance of managing speed. If there's one lesson here, you are not working on Vision Zero if you're not working on managing speed. It's the speed that kills. Vision Zero is not about crash prevention. That's not it. It's about fatality and severe injury prevention, and that's mainly about speed. So can you talk to briefly why and how you're prioritizing speed? Sure. Yeah. So. Um, in San Francisco, advocates in the city came together around prioritizing speed for this year. That has been our theme for the year, so to speak. And why is because 25% of people are killed because of speed in San Francisco. And we all know why. We've seen the data and we've seen the stats. We know it increases stopping distance. We know that um, as speed doubles, stopping distance triples. Um, and we've got some interesting slide stuff going on, so just ignore ignore this. Sorry. Um, uh, so the way you know we're we're tackling speed um, really at the heart is engineering. So engineering streets that reflect the speeds we want to drive people to drive at. This is not rocket science. I'm sure you're all doing it. Um, and you know through that you know with that we're working to engage communities in this conversation. We're prioritizing equity by engaging the communities that disproportionately are impacted in helping to redesign and reshape their streets and, and prioritizing investments in those communities. Um, and you know, at the same time, it takes a lot of time to redesign streets. It takes a lot of capital. Um, so we're doing the quick and cost effective things, but at the same time, we also need that enforcement. And, um, and so John Knox White is in here. He's leading a campaign on speed. He's at the back if you wanna talk to him about community education on speed. He's leading a great campaign that's just rolling out. Um, so from the enforcement angle, we're working on automated speed enforcement. Um, I'm not gonna explain too much what it is because I think I've already gone over this one minute. But again, sorry for the slide mishap. But, um, you know, the more, most amazing thing is that with automated speed enforcement or safety cameras, whatever you want to call them, um, cities across the country have seen tremendous increases not only in speeding, but in Washington, D.C., in 10 years, a 70% decrease in fatalities. So to me, that is, um, you know, an unprecedented number or decrease. We need this in order to achieve Vision Zero. Um, so we're working with our city and in a, what's been a really great partnership between advocates in the city 
mostly because we get to pressure someone else together. Um, so we're pressuring Sacramento or state capital to allow us to use automated speed enforcement to enforce the speed limit and start saving lives just like over 140 communities um, that are already using this life-saving technology throughout the U.S. I'm going to skip to the last question, you guys. And that is, um, folks have seen, we've all seen the relatively rapid growth of Vision Zero in the U.S., a wonderful thing, something we can celebrate. People are shifting their thinking around this. I would say there is also a risk, though, um, frankly, that Vision Zero becomes watered down, that it becomes a slogan, that it becomes a PR campaign, that it becomes less worthy than it is. Um, and I know that's something on our minds, you know, locally and across the nation. What would you say are ways we need to protect against that and keep this commitment meaningful and strong? Okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're grappling with this a lot in New York City. We, we have, um, you know, we have never had safer streets. We've never had fewer crashes um, leading to injury and death. But this year, we actually are sort of flatlining and the pedestrian numbers, our bike numbers have gone up slightly and our hit and, run, hit and run numbers have gone up. Um, and so we're asking ourselves this question. I think one thing that we're thinking um, about in particular as we head to another mayoral election in 2017 is the importance of, of um, making Vision Zero more of a permanent part of the way um, city agencies are doing work. And so specifically we're talking about passing some local laws that will hold the city more to account when it comes to its own timelines around Vision Zero and to its own deliverables around Vision Zero for, you know, for example, the health hazards at Cole. Um, one of the first things that our Department of Transportation did when, when the Vision Zero policy went into effect is they produced five different pedestrian safety reports, although they didn't bike head and driver safety reports, which is pedestrian, um, one for each borough of New York City. And what those reports did is they outlined the most dangerous streets in each borough, so the, the highest KSI in each in each borough. <clears throat> They're blueprints for where we need the streets we need to fix for the 12% of the streets, right? It's a roadmap. There's zero timeline associated with fixing those streets. There's not enough funding that's been dedicated to those streets getting fixed. And so what we have now is a great problem statement, but not really the resolve or the intention to fix the problem quickly. So we're we're working very hard right now to draw attention to that, to find ways to have our, our local city council help us with that, um, and to bring the focus back to street design, because I think one of the things we've noticed is that um, a lot of lip service gets sort of played around enforcement, and enforcement actually is not a permanent fix for um, street safety issues, as we know. Um, if you rely on human error, or you rely on cops to do the job of protecting people on the street. And so, yeah, so street design and then grading that in the system is something else. Um, I would say for us, um, you know, we're two and a half years in around, uh, and we've we spent the first couple of years really just working on the policy, um, working on the exact actions that we'd want each agency to take. We have, I think, 11 different city policies that have been adopted, with most of which have specific actions, uh, reporting metrics or uh, methods. Um, and I would say the last year as advocates we spent a lot of time kind of watchdogging the city making sure those things get implemented um, helping the city agencies kind of come together around checklists and it processes um, and now that that's happened one of the things that the city agreed to do is build about 13 miles of improvements per year um, and the challenge I think is when there's opposition, um, it, built, making sure that those projects aren't watered down. And there, it's, it's very similar to the same old story, but we just thought that with Vision Zero, when, you know, you, adopting the policy is the easiest part, of that, you know, in retrospect. Um, and you can feel great and say you're gonna save lives, but then it's really, um, it's still a challenge to actually pass the projects that save lives and put those forth with confidence and having that leadership to say, um, you know, we're dealing with a project right now where parking's actually being relocated, it's not even being removed. Um, and there's the MTA is still compromising on safety in this project. And um, it's just heartbreaking that, you know, it's like which one of your friends are you willing to send into this dangerous intersection and have hit by a car because you wouldn't do 
the full, complete, safe solution. I'd love to open up to questions. Please just raise your hand and we'll get going. Great. I have a quick speed question. The standard wisdom is that you change the speed limit sign, it doesn't change anything, you have to change the urban environment. I don't want to wait until all the streets change, all the urban environment changes. So when you do across the board, we're going from 30 to 25, 25 to 20, does that rule then break down and we get better outcomes and success? Can we get rid of that myth? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. Um, it's one of the reasons, that, though, I will say why we are very focused on automated enforcement. Because you have the lag time between being able to rebuild the streets to, to be 25 mile an hour streets or 20 mile an hour streets, which is inevitable and we can't wait, as you say. Um, I think it's promising, though, that in New York City, and I think this may be the case in other cities, and speak, speak to this, um, we have seen reductions as a result of something as simple as changing the speed limit. So I think it's 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 the combination, obviously, of all those things. But I don't think it would be wise to dis discredit the idea, right? And we've been doing a lot of work to highlight that um, and to make that very visible to people. And I think that that's a very important part of changing something like the speed limit is doing great marketing around the fact that you've done that and why you've done that and, and finding um, different channels to let people know about it. And, and New York has has been making an effort to do that. Yeah, I would say um, in San Francisco we have 15 mile per hour school zones, um, only on residential streets basically, but uh, the one thing, I don't think anyone actually drives 15 miles per hour, I don't have the data to back that up though, but the one thing that's good about it is um, when, they, when a school submits a traffic calming application, um, they're prioritized because everyone's going way faster than the speed limit, so they can get the speed hump first, um, they can get those engineering approved first that actually would result in that 15 mile per hour driving pattern. I'll just say, I think we're having a lot more complex and more productive discussions around speed these days with, with more people at the table and just really acknowledging that that is the crux of it, right? And there are many tools to affect it and we've, we've got to be doing that. But how do we, people talk about culture change, your vision zero, it's going to take culture change. Absolutely. It's all the little things, not little, little and medium and big things we're all doing. But one of the big ones is going to be making speeding the next drunk driving, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody nods their head and says, of course I drive drunk. Yeah, all the time, right? <laughs> Nobody does that. But do we all speed? You know, does everybody, yeah, yeah, right? I mean, how are we shifting that over the next decade or so? I'll just plant that seed. <laughs> Other questions? In the middle. Oh, hi. Um, so we've been talking about how Vision Zero is largely about managing speed. Um, so can Vision Zero be compatible with the suburbs where um, we sort of predicated all of our land use decisions on the ability to go fast. I'll say that I, I, I take heart that this is not an easy, perfect answer, but it was surprising to me to learn that Sweden's success, frankly, in dropping their fatality numbers, traffic fatality overall numbers by 50% over the last 10 to 15 years, it happened mostly in non-urban areas. And that is not to dissuade us from our focus on urban we are seeing a different momentum here, right? We're seeing the, the energy come mostly from cities at this point. That is expanding. It's really exciting to see suburbs, rural, counties, et cetera. And it's, it's absolutely, there is a model for that. Does it look a little bit different than the urban model? I, I think it will. But most of the, the principles are going to be the same. And it is possible. It's going to take some different, you know, different features and different approaches. I would say it's not where our emphasis is right now in this country, but it needs to go there. So I don't mean to put that off, but... Okay. Yeah, I would say that's probably why it's even more important that proactive bike and ped planning are happening alongside any safety goals that are set because to, to say, you know, we have the safety goal but our streets are not going to change at all and you're still being asked to use your car in the same exact way you're using your car is really a disservice to the effort being had. It's easier in cities to, to think about I think, managing speed, right? But um, there's a lot of great work happening around the country in towns and smaller communities around bike and pet planning that are opening up other opportunities for people to move around in different ways. Kathy? So we didn't do that. I didn't know it was a problem yet. <laughs> I also want to give kudos to Boston. We didn't do a shout out yet. Um, the Boston just in the last month or so successfully lobbied and won uh, uh, the ability to lower their speed limits there at the state level too, which is a huge deal. Okay. We have a pilot project. Yeah, so the city of Portland took a slightly different approach because um, we just got legislative authority to do Puerto Rico last year. So we, instead of going to our state legislator, went to the Oregon Speed Zone Board. 
and proposed a new process that they're going to let us pilot for two years. And the process does away with the 85th percentile speed and sets speeds based on the context of the road. Mm -hmm. So it's automatically 20 miles an hour if there's bike and pad present. Um, if, it, if it's a shared use road, if it's a roadway, then it's 25 miles and there's a 30. I'm happy to share those materials, but I think what's interesting about Portland's proposal is rather than a blanket across, it's challenging kind of the foundation of how we've set speeds in the past. So we're hopeful that the pilot is successful and we can do this ongoing for years to come. So thank you, Portland. Welcome, everybody, to share that with me. It's more of a comment, maybe or a suggestion than a question, but I'm wondering if you've considered bringing the automobile manufacturers into this discussion uh, in maybe two important ways uh, that, that haven't probably been considered before. Uh, number one, if you look at the uh, speedometer on the average new car, it goes up to like 140 miles per hour. <laughs> And frankly, being able to distinguish between 20 and 30 is actually kind of difficult if you don't have the digital speedometer. And you know, changing the way the calibration is done on the speedometer, and maybe even having the numbers kind of shaded in color so that the gradation mm -hmm. you know, to kind of well, just to kind of signify that something more dangerous occurs, you know, between 20 and 30 and 40. Mm -hmm. um, this is a thought. And another thought is uh, headlight design because many, many crashes occur at night. And I, read recently that the Insurance Institute for uh, Auto Safety has just recently started ranking uh, headlight effectiveness, which they've never really done before. Uh, and anybody who's driven cars in Europe knows that the headlight design is very different, and it's a sweep to the headlight beam that illuminates the, the side of the road in a way that allows motorists to pick up pedestrians more, more easily so they can aim for them. Uh, or <laughs> avoid them, uh, as the case may be. Um, and, and so, so sort of calling out manufacturers that are doing a better or worse job of, of headlight design uh, within the parameters of what's permitted in the U.S. anyway, uh, it's, a, it's another thought. It's a huge lesson to learn for us in the U.S. Again, back, um, again, Sweden, the Netherlands, they have a lot more unified and focused effort, first on the auto technology community, um, but also from their federal government. You know, their national government is leading on these things. I don't think it's a huge surprise to anyone here. Our national government is not leading on these things. Um, so how do we get that kind of leadership there is a great question. But I think I do think it's starting to trickle up. I think we're hearing DC folks notice. I mean, absolutely seeing them notice what's happening in these communities and say, what can we do to help? Those are great ideas. Yeah. I just want to acknowledge that it is time. We have a decent chunk. I'm happy to stay another 10 minutes and keep going on questions, but if you need to leave, feel free, feel free, feel free. Uh -huh. but we'll do another 10 minutes of questions. Christine? Thanks, Leah. Um, I'm glad you brought up the automotive uh, sector, because in our area, we are among the, we are among the t uh, t test zone for um, autonomous vehicles uh, on our highways. So we have a lot of feedback, and I'm wondering if you're getting this too. We don't have to worry about any walk-by, because the autonomous vehicle is going to solve all our problems. So, you know, except that we're seeing no evidence of that so far. Right. Okay. So, but how, yes. how do we how do we say? Well, there is a sense of urgency, and our needs are not going to go away or be solved. Could we see the autonomous vehicle? But this is a potential problem. It's a huge question. What I've been saying to folks is that we can't wait. We can't depend on technology. That a is not today. Right. It's not ready now. We can't depend, and we can't wait. And everything we're doing in our regular world needs to happen. And I think we need to have more eyes on that prize, however you say it. And I'll be honest, I, I mean, a lot of local and advocacy folks are not at that table of, I, don't, I mean, if people know those folks, let us know. But I think, again, a place where we need to demand that our feds are more involved, you know, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and others taking a leadership there and, and regulating. I mean, it is going to take regulation. This can't all be about, you know, love and joy and incentives. There's going to need to be some sticks as well as carrots. Well, one thing, one thing we're working on uh, with the SFMTA, our Municipal Transportation Agency, is actually piloting crash prevention technology on minibuses. So we'd much rather see this technology being used for autonomous vehicles actually integrated into preventing crashes from happening on uh, mass transit, public transportation, not just the elite's transportation, um, and not just through individual vehicles traveling around in our Wally 
Wally-ish future, but more like, you know, so that's something that we're working on. The MTA is committed to doing that within the next 12 months. And I think they're actually borrowing some lessons learned from a, a small pilot in New York City. So. Yeah, and actually I will mention for those interested, we're doing our, our third Vision Zero conference in May in New York City, May 2nd to 4th. I have seen the date post if you're interested. One of the focuses will be this technology component. I think we're trying to proactively get a seat at the table, um, start talking to these companies, start putting ourselves in the room where these conversations are happening as a way to preempt some of the things that you're raising which are concerns, I think real, very real concerns. And this conference has been so far a forum uh, for collaboration to begin. So we can continue to do that. So we'll take the final question or two. Hey. On that, oh, on the speed thing, they were like, there was lobbying going on for 20 miles per hour. Was there, was there a compromise that it was 25, yeah. or was some yeah. streets 20, some 25? Yeah, it's like a long saga story there, but anyway. So, yeah. Um, you know, 20 was our campaign because 20 is where the data is. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll cut those those injuries and fatalities down if we drop the speed limit 10 miles an hour. Um, we had to make a compromise, and it, it took a coming together of. Um, in order to get the city to work with us on lowering the speed limit, um, they needed, they wanted to work on 25. And it, it was hard, you know, families for safe streets, it was really hard for them um, to give up 20 because they knew the numbers were on, on the side of 20. But I think ultimately we saw like the greater good and um, that was the compromise. So 20 next time. Chad, final question. Is there any relationship between impaired driving and speeding so that you can get the impaired driving advocates to support the speed cameras? Great question. I'm sure there is a relationship between, right? I mean, drunk driving, drug driving, and speeding, yes. Um, it's interesting that they do feel kind of like separate efforts in many ways and, and probably shouldn't in so many ways. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we've had, we've, we've done, um, Families for Safe Streets met with Candy Leitner, the founder of MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, very early on because it was intriguing to them, interesting to them to learn. Um, we've been in close touch with those folks, we stay, stay in touch. I actually asked for their help when we were fighting the bus driver union in Albany, um, and they sort of helped. They have a very strict rule about the work that they get involved with and that that they don't, and unless there is, um, Sometimes drugs with mostly alcohol involved. They draw a line and they will not um, sort of throw in. Um, and I think Leah's right. You know, we I'm I'm troubled by the fact that the press, um, most policymakers, I think the public, they were so effective um, at, at criminalizing drunk driving that now, unless there was drugs or drinking involved, crashes are still deemed accidents. Mm -hmm. So we have this huge barrier. Speeding really isn't thought of in the same way. So I think it's you know it's a, it's a great question, but I don't I don't know if their merge with us is what mm -hmm. will take or if it's something more than that. Mm -hmm. what, what is it about um, infrastructure or lack of infrastructure in underprivileged communities that creates a higher level of fatality versus the other neighborhoods? I mean I think we we have seen. Records of, of disinvestment or, or poor planning. I mean, data will show for the U.S. You know, far fewer sidewalks. You know, relatively speaking, fewer sidewalks, fewer, fewer bikeways in low-income communities, communities of color. Faster one-way arterials that are proven to be more unsafe. Right? It's it's literally these neighborhoods have been designed in a way that are are less safe, and not consciously. I mean, I don't think someone literally said, let's make this super dangerous, right? But these are the communities that have not had a voice at the table, have not been, you know, politically organized in a way to fight that freeway coming down, or to fight that new arterial, or to demand those sidewalks, you know? And they shouldn't have to. And to me, it's really exciting. I want to give huge credit to you guys. I know I've seen it in my city of San Francisco, where it's also meant this really wonderful, and I think very effective coming together of your quote unquote traditional transportation advocates, you know, the pedestrian and bicycle and transit advocates who are very transportation focused, really coming together in a much more deep, I think, and, and, and influential way with communities of color, low income communities, people with disabilities, seniors. I mean, are there, are there shared goals there? Of course, but it hasn't really in many cities 
come together in a way that feels um, meaningful and lasting. And I think Vision Zero is, is helping that happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't really have that much to add. I mean, you said you hit the nail on the head. It's just a lot of disinvestment, um, poor design, design without actually consulting communities. So our goal is really through the coalition empowering those communities. We train community-based organizations. Um, like we train tenant organizers that live in SROs to organize, you know, go out on a walk on it and understand why their streets are dangerous and what, and come up with solutions to improve those streets. Um, those sorts of things. People actually really care about safety on their streets. It's amazing. We're we're working with some of the poorest communities in the country, and uh, there's mental health, drug overdose uh, issues, drug, you know. All of these po like incredible poverty, and people still care because they and their friends are getting hit all the time, um, and they see it and they feel it, and they lose loved ones over it. And many people I work with are um, disabled because of traffic crashes. So um, it's really it's it's really a powerful movement to bring those folks together and to um, it's really gratifying to have them engaged in the planning process, give them that power. I just want to wrap up with one thought that I think it's really interesting. I know we come to these pro walk, pro bike conferences for way too long to name. Um, and we haven't really talked, for me at least, we don't talk about safety historically super openly. I mean, it's in there. There's like a chart, a lot of charts around safety. We talk about really good things about livability and placemaking and, and walkability and all the good things that come with these, right? Better business. And that's a good thing. I want all those things too. I'm really excited we're kind of bringing it back to safety while also having all of those things. These things can coexist, and I think in your communities and all these Vision Zero communities, we're seeing that. It is not a matter of, we don't need to give up the celebration and the promotion of the walking and biking and positivity that, that I think something like this conference really does a great job of and that so many of us are doing in our communities, while also bringing in the very urgent, life-saving message of we deserve to be safe. So the question that sometimes comes up is, you know, how can we go talk about the safety piece when we're really trying to promote walking and biking in a positive way? We can do it, we are doing it. I'm not saying it's easy, but you really need to think about how to balance those things, but it's absolutely possible. And I would say to get to this place of great walking, biking, livability, you're gonna have to talk about and work on and prioritize these safety issues more, in my opinion. Thank you, yes. And we really will let you go now. Thank you. So this is just a little, um, I'm drawing too much to read here, but a, a last point to say, the Vision Zero Network is a nonprofit that exists for people interested in Vision Zero. Please use us as a resource. Check out the website, visionzeronetwork.org. We've got a lot of resources there, case studies. Um, our goal is to network communities together, whether that's advocates like these guys, or city staff, and consultants and such like many of you perhaps, to really connect and learn from each other. So please check that out, and um, there's lots of information like this there. Thank you for coming. Thank you.